Derek, Azu, Anli, my dear Marina, <laughs> you all met Marina for sure, and Tariq. We will be your co-hosts for this session, and I'm just so glad to see you all here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome momentarily the former president of Ghana, my home country. I was born in Accra. I'm a proud Ghanaian. I've been all around the world. And one of the things I must say in all respect to the entire planet, but one thing I must say about Ghanaians is we have respect for ourselves and we have respect for our elders. We recognize that the people who have come before us are able to guide us and give us a path in which we can follow and learn more as we go. We have a saying, a symbol in our culture called Sankofa. It means go to your past, fetch what is valuable. Let it under help you understand your present and direct your future. The person who's coming before you today has so much of value to share, not only from his own past, but the work he is doing in the present and what it means for the future of my community and for our global communities. He is currently the chair of the TANA Forum on Peace and Security in Africa. He was Ghana's president from 2012 to 2017. He was beloved among the youth because he was the youngest president in Ghana, the first to be born after colonialism. He was the chair of ECOWAS, working with the United Nations, the US, and the EU during the time of the Ebola crisis and was able to provide immediate relief to the people in the West African re region who needed it so dearly. He's an accomplished speaker, an acclaimed writer. He's the author of a best-selling and critically acclaimed book titled, My First Coup d'Etat. I'm gonna come back to that momentarily. He was born in the Domongo region of Ghana in the north. He's only the second president of Ghana from the northern region. And he's currently a candidate in the 2024 presidency for Ghana, and he received a 99% mandate from his party. One of the things that's powerful, I think, in hearing from such an important historical figure from our country, his father was one of the ministers of Ghana's first government, Ghana being the first sub-Saharan African nation to gain independence from colonialism. The reason his book is titled, My First Coup d'Etat, is not because he took over the country. It's because his father was jailed when the first ever coup in Ghana was orchestrated to depose our liberationary president, president then Kwame Nkrumah. So you're seeing a legacy of liberation, of wisdom, and of pride in our culture and who we are. It is with great pleasure and deep respect that I welcome to the stage President John Mahama. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this Humanity Summit. I'd like to begin with a story, and let's call it a tale of two cities. Accra is the capital of Ghana, which used to be a British colony. Lomé is the capital of Togo, which used to be a French colony. It takes approximately three and a half to four hours to drive by road from one city to the other. But not so long ago, and by that I mean within the course of my lifetime, if you mailed a letter from Accra to someone in Lomé, that letter would first be sent directly to London for processing, and then next it will go to Paris where it will be processed further, and then it will be forwarded to Lomi and finally delivered to the recipient of the letter. The same thing used to be true of telephone calls. If you made a telephone call, it was routed the same way. And air travel between the two countries 
They would all first be routed through a colonial country before reaching the intended destination. That was the norm, the standard, the way things were done. I've been asked to speak to you this morning about creating a new paradigm of trade between the global north and the global south. What would that look like? What would it entail? And how would it be implemented? Let me just point out very quickly that the labels global north and global south are actually misnomers because Australia, which is considered part of the global north, is pretty far in the south. And the majority of Asia, that is considered part of the global south, well, they are east, really. So these labels aren't actually indications of the cardinal points. They are illusory, simply a nice, inoffensive way to identify nations that are considered developed and therefore hold power and those that are not. This is something that should not be overlooked or forgotten. I'll speak on it more in a short while. For the purpose of this address, I'll concentrate primarily on the continent of Africa out of the 78 nations that make up the global south. I began with that story, the tale of two cities, because even though on its surface it has nothing to do with trade, at its core it brings into sharp focus many of the impositions, the limitations, and false dependencies that were created by the scramble for Africa. It is impossible to create a new face understanding the current one. And it's impossible to understand the current paradigm without a full comprehension of the foundation upon which it was built. A foundation that was reliant upon the acquisition and maintenance of complete power. It is common knowledge that within the individual colonized territories, a divide and conquer strategy was executed. But what we often don't consider is that the same strategy, whether intentional or merely consequential, was set in motion on the continent as a whole. There were various colonial powers in many places and at different times, drawing artificial borders that had no consideration for any of the pre-existing social structures or alliances. Take Ghana and Togo, for example. They have in common several ethnic groups because the traditional terrain of those people was split by the border that was drawn between the two countries. And depending on which side of the divide they were on, those groups' languages, their cultures, and customs were shaped in drastically different ways. Togo was colonized first by the Germans and later by the French. Ghana was colonized by the British. Oh, and the Portuguese enterprising navigators and explorers. They hold the distinction of being the first Europeans to arrive in that region, exerting tremendous influence. The point I'm making is that for several centuries, we Africans, Ethiopia and Liberia, have been under the consistent authority of Europeans people who were not of our land. And yet, we do Africa a tremendous disservice to center our stories around colonization, to ignore or dismiss the sophistication of its pre-colonial empires and the success of their trade and their commerce. 
The Mahdi Empire, which was in existence from the 12th to the 17th centuries, stretched from as far north as Mauritania, as far south as Burkina Faso, east as modern-day Niger, and as far west as the coast of the Gambia. It was a famously rich empire, and it gained most of its wealth from trading. They traded all throughout North Africa and into the Mediterranean lands. At the height of this empire's power, it was ruled by a king called Mansa Musa, who is said to have been the richest man in history. Some sources have estimated his wealth to be as much as the equivalent of 400 billion modern US dollars. There's also the Aksumite Empire in East Africa, which exported gold and ivory throughout East and North Africa into Southern Sudan and Yemen. There was the Great Zimbabwe Kingdom, which was engaged in trade with China at the time, and Persia and the Arab world. I could go on and on. There were that many notable empires and kingdoms from the top of the African continent to the bottom. While we should not around colonialism, we also cannot deny the way it has shaped our stories into this present day narrative of Africa as being poor and eternally developing, incapable of handling its own affairs, and a place full of shithole countries. The African continent has been so misrepresented and misjudged that it is often difficult to have constructive conversations about it without ensuring that everybody involved in this discussion has an accurate peer view. So let's agree on this. When it comes to African nations, sovereignty and independence, though often used interchangeably, these are not synonyms. In terms of sovereignty, the first sub-Saharan nation to liberate itself from colonial rule was Ghana, my country, which turned 65 earlier this year, on March 6th, making it a year older than me. And even though my children think of me as being ancient, I do not consider myself that quite old. <laughs> the last African nation to gain its freedom from colonial rule was Namibia in 1990, making it 33 years old, which is younger than many of you in this audience today. You don't need to be a historian to realize that in the larger scheme of things, these stretches of time are brief, filling anywhere between a paragraph and a page in a textbook. And though we are managing our own governmental affairs, it is not without impositions and interference from the so-called global north. In many significant ways, we are not independent, certainly not when it comes to trade. The world trading system has made Africa out to be the supplier of raw materials. We have been placed in the position of being the exporters of primary products and the importers of finished goods. I worded this the way I did, placed in a position of being because African countries hold little to no power in any part of the trading process. The global north, through their trade and stock exchanges, determine the prices of raw materials. African countries are supplying the global north with rare earth minerals and other products, natural resources such as timber, lithium, cobalt, copper, bauxite, manganese, gold, oil, cocoa, 
tea, coffee, and spices. The Global North processes these items, using them to make furniture, jewelry, computers, mobile phones, cars, and even chocolates. And then they sell them back to Africa at prices that are determined by the Global North. The Global North also owns the shipping lines, and the Global North controls the trade channels, and the routes are between the North and South, and not within Africa. Let's return to the issue of development and power. If we are considered developing nations, how then, within this paradigm, can we ever become developed? Or is it that we are actually, as the late Pan-Africanist historian, Dr. Walter Rodney, posited, being worldly underdeveloped within this paradigm? One of the hallmarks in every analysis of the relationship between the global north and the global south is power. And it's an issue that has its roots in colonialism. In their book, A New Weave on Power, People, and Politics, social justice advocates Lisa Van Klaas, Klassen and author Valerie Miller explore the concept of power in the form of four different expressions. These expressions of power offer tremendous insights into both the past relationships between the Global North and the Global South, and offer vital clues on what is necessary to ensure the success of the new paradigm that, that's, that's being built. One expression of power is the power over. And this adequately describes the dynamic of colonization, whereby one group of people exert power over another. Another expression is the power to, and is currently what exists. Though the global south is comprised of sovereign nations, because we exist in a state of economic dependence on the global north, they hold the power to dictate the terms of engagement. And these are terms that will always be favorable to them. A third expression is the power within and this is one that African nations are already in the midst of forging. The protocols of the African Continental Free Trade Area have been ratified by the overwhelming majority of African countries. This common sense instrument for removing trade barriers between African countries is expected to boost trade amongst African countries themselves from a paltry 11% to about 50% in the next few decades. Switzerland is known for chocolate, but does Switzerland actually grow cocoa? Imagine Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, the largest exporters of cocoa in the world actually being able to widely export their own brands of chocolate. English breakfast tea is a popular breakfast beverage all over the world. I'm sure some of you had tea this morning. But does England actually grow tea? Imagine if Kenya, one of the largest exporters of both tea and coffee, were able to export their own brand, local brands of uh, tea and coffee widely throughout the world. The power within is also a reclamation of a consciousness that has been with us all along. It is the consciousness of the King Mansa Musa and the great kingdoms that existed in Africa. It's the consciousness of a courageous woman, Nana Ya Santua, and those who fought in the war she led, those involved in the Chimurenga as well as the Mau Mau resistance of Kenya. 
And people like Patrice Lumumba, Nelson Mandela, Samora Michelle, Augustino Neto, is a consciousness of our own dignity, our inherent worth, and the limitless possibilities. Once Africa has established the power within, that is to say, once we have empowered ourselves, we will then be in a position, insofar as trade is concerned, to negotiate with the global north the fourth expression of power, and that is the power with. And that is a relationship based on mutual respect, cooperation, and decree. Only then can we honestly say that a new paradigm has been created in world trade. In conclusion, I would like to revisit the story of Lomé and Accra. That's the tale of two cities. Though it was once, not so long ago, the norm to route mail, phone calls, and travel from one African country to another through Europe, that is no longer the case. At least not with mail and phone calls. We still have some way to go with air travel, but we're getting there. Contrary to the constant barrage of pessimistic news and negative commentary about the African continent, a lot of progress has been made, and it will continue to be made. Look at what we've already accomplished. Moreover, time, country after another, after another, and after another, like dominoes falling, gaining independence. The sort of solidarity that recognizes us as one united force, one continent of wonderfully diverse people whose destinies are forever intertwined. I want to thank you so much for your invitation to be here and to thank you so much for your time and kind attention. Aluta, Continua, Vitoria, etc. Thank you. Thank you.